The Sullivan Museum and History Center welcomes you to the second of our two science fiction inspired lunch and learns. I am Joseph Cates, the Curator of Education and Public Programs at the Sullivan Museum. I'm a lifelong science fiction enthusiast and as a historian, I have studied the historical influences on science fiction and often use Star Wars in my classes to teach about Jungian archetypes as proposed by Carl Jung. With me today is Professor Glennie Sewell, who was a proud member of the Norwich University faculty until the COVID crisis and is in his 12th year for Troy University with Troy Online as a world literature and composition professor. He heads Messenger Guardian Paranormal Investigation Studios in Montpelier and the, with the assistance of former Norwich graduates. Glennie has used science fiction literature and film as a means to teach about the advancement of the human condition. Today, we'll be discussing how Star Wars architect George Lucas was influenced by history, theology, mysticism, and mythology to create the Star Wars universe. When George Lucas developed the storyline for Star Wars and crafted his heroes and villains, he tapped into these elements as well as his knowledge of classical films. The fitting a story set a long time ago, real life history has played a central role in shaping the filmmaker's space opera. Lucas took aspects of comparative mythology, also known as the hero's journey, as a template for Star Wars. In the hero's journey, a hero goes on an adventure, is victorious in a decisive crisis, and comes home changed and trans or transformed. In addition to the use of mythology, we will also discuss how Star Wars prop makers were faced with the task of creating lots of futuristic looking movie guns. Many of the weapons were repurposed weapons from World War II. They used George Lucas's approach of drawing from history and taking existing guns and adding bits and pieces to make them look a little more as if they were advanced weapons. While the psychological basis of Star Wars is mythological, the political and social basis are historical. George Lucas loves history. In fact, the filmmaker is such a history buff that he collaborated with the publication of 2013 book, Star Wars and History, which was edited by history professor Nancy R. Regan of Pace University and Janice Liddell of Laurentian University. Written by a dozen leading historians and reviewed and confirmed by Lucas, Star Wars and History identifies the numerous real life figures and events that inspired the science fiction franchise, including, um, if we can go to the first slide. Okay. Um, there's nothing subtle about the illusions in Star Wars. After all, the elite assault forces fanatically devoted to the Galactic Empire or shared common with, share a common name with the paramilitary fighters who defended the Nazi party, the stormtroopers. The Imperial officers' uniforms and even Darth Vader's helmet resemble those worn by German army members in World War II. And the gradual rise of Palpatine from Chancellor to Emperor mirrored Adolf Hitler's similar political ascent from chancellor to dictator. The empire wasn't the only side in Star Wars that crept from the Nazi imagery though. Medals um, to rebel heroes, Luke Skywalker and Han Solo, while soldiers stood at attention, echoed the massive Nazi rallies at Nuremberg, captured in Lenny Riefenstahl's 1935 propaganda film, Triumph of Will. And do you know who Palpatine was modeled after? Okay. <laughs> now you're going into sticky territory here. You have Richard Nixon. Yes. But well, recent history will now 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 drops and a few other things too that I won't yes. mention. But we I weren't agree. expecting recent history with with the mm -hmm. kind of things we're talking about now. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Richard Nixon. Um, that's who 
George Lucas said he had in mind. Um, he was asked in a 1981 story conference um, if Palpatine was a Jedi. And Lucas said, no, he was a politician. Richard M. Nixon was his name. He subverted the Senate and finally took over and became an imperial guy. And he was really evil. But he pretended to be a really nice guy. <laughs> and in 2005 interview, um, he, Lucas said he originally conceived Star Wars as a reaction to the Nixon presidency. He said it was really about the Vietnam War. And that was a period where Nixon was trying to run for a second term, which got me to thinking historically about how do democracies get turned into dictatorships? Because the democracies aren't overthrown, they're given away. And it, and that, that reminds me of, um, and, and of course, because the line's important and because it falls uh, it falls in the middle trilogy, it falls in the prequel, mm -hmm. where um, where Senator Amidala says, so this is how liberty dies, mm -hmm. with, thun with thunderous applause, yeah. you know, and, and, she's, and she's right, and again, we, we have proof of that in recent history, in our own mm -hmm. very recent history, that are, there are so many who are willing to completely give it away, yeah. you know, within mm -hmm. the core of the government, which is exactly what happened in Star Wars, the senator, the Senate simply gave their power. What? Yeah. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I always find the part about the Vietnam War a little interesting. Um, if you can go, are we okay? With the in Return of the Jedi, of course, you have the Ewoks, a very primitive people. Mm -hmm. I don't know. This doesn't say much for George Lucas, in my opinion, but he compared them to the Viet Cong, who weren't well. Um, well, as well armed as the Americans right. were in Vietnam, um, although they were supplied quite a bit of weapons from uh, Russian, Chinese, and all that. Right. So, um, but he compared the Viet Cong with the Ewoks, who helped to overthrow the Empire in the final battle. Right. So, um, I just find that kind of interesting that, um, you know. I've always heard, you know, that the Ewoks were the little guy who defeats the great empire. So, right. And and, and you and you want to <laughs> ask yourself questions about how far was he envisioning the Ewoks and the Viet? I mean, it, I mean, I'm not going to take it to to mean far more than what he truly yes. intended. Mm -hmm. It's just that he probably didn't give it more thought that. So they're short, little. You can't hardly understand mm -hmm. them. Is there a? Is a? You wondered if, he, and 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 going by how George Lucas has written and how others saved his, saved his scripts by going through and cutting scenes and mm -hmm. editing it differently. My thought is that he had so much on his plate that it didn't occur to him to think about that part either. Yeah. It just didn't occur to him to think about it. What he could have done about it, I don't know. The Ewoks mm -hmm. turned out to be perfect. What? But but it does make you wonder. But it, sometimes I think we're responsible for overthinking things. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's in the back of your mind whether you know what 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 other aspects did he use to project onto the Viet Cong or mm -hmm. onto others uh, onto others from that from that war with these kind of little furry characters. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, they, were they considered cute and adorable? Yeah. And I mean, I'm not saying they wouldn't be, but I'm I'm just saying that cute and adorable parts seem to be Make, seem to somehow make it more sad when they when they got hit by by weapon yeah. by weapons fire or whatever you know all that kind of thing. It's like okay, so where am I going with this? Am I supposed to feel that way about that? It's that psychological thing mm -hmm. that you get backed up in when you're thinking about these yeah. kind of archetypes being used and these mm -hmm. kind of these kind of tropes being used by the writers. Now again, I'm not making a judgment. Mm -hmm. It's an observation. To make yeah. a judgment about it is to spin out in, in my opinion. But yeah. Well, you know, the Ewoks were gonna eat the main characters that yes, when they were. first showed up. <laughs> <laughs> but that's <laughs> yes. And I honestly think that that was that it, that was almost a joking function from oh, yeah. from Lucas's writing and not well, anything about the Viet Cong. Yeah, well, so, you yeah. get to use um, C-3PO as a guy. Right, so. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it, you do think about it. When you see those kind of issues, and when you see those kind of tropes being used, you wonder about 
what was the purpose he was trying to play towards mm -hmm. without trying to drag down everyone and everything involved in the production just because you think it might have been something more negative when it turns out it really wasn't yeah um, especially mm -hmm. when you're not on the inside of something looking back out and mm -hmm. we're outside of it looking in yeah. wishing we were inside maybe that's the good <laughs> thing about this and about what we do yeah. here is we wish we were inside mm -hmm. looking out along with the writers and along with the production staff so yeah yeah and then when you get to the Jedi, there, you know, you think of knights. So you obviously mm -hmm. think of, you know, um, the Knights Templar or the, especially the Knights Templar because they were very, the Jedi are very similar to them in that they are a religious order. They take a vow of celibacy. Um, even the way they're dressed is somewhat similar to the robes that the Knights Templar wore. Um, and of course, there's a lot of mythology about the Jedi, um, well, the Jedi in well, Knights Templar. Um, but when we get to, um, is it Revenge of the Sith? That's yes. the third, third the episode. Right, in the, in the prequel. Yeah, when they go out and slaughter the Jedi, it's very similar to what um, King, let me see which he okay. was, Louis, no, Philip the Fourth. The French King Philip IV, when he annihilates the Knights Templar, um, starting on October 13th, 1307. So on the Friday of the 13th, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, but, and if you look at Philip's um, reasoning for doing that, part of it is because everybody owed money to the Knights Templar and they were very powerful beyond what they probably should have been or where a lot of people thought and if Philip destroyed them he could confiscate their money too but with the Galactic Empire um, when it's established if they get rid of the Jedi then they can take their place in a way of defenders and what's interesting about about that whole concept is as is much as I think that by this point um in this in in the star wars um this complex you know nine movie and two or what was it two other and two and smaller anthologies yeah mm -hmm. um that worked into the films but we get to a point by wondering what did the what did the jedi do that brought down their own order mm -hmm. you know so because we're beyond the whole oh good and evil in the in the first in the first trilogy i would say before the end of the first trilogy yeah, we were beyond that. We're beyond that point now. Now mm -hmm. we're wanting to, we're in gray territory. What did the Jedi themselves do that allowed for their order to be brought down? And I think it was, it, Lucas had placed it, had placed it in Yoda's mouth, where Yoda said that the dark side clouds, you know, the dark side clouds us. Mm -hmm. And it was their own arrogance that allowed them to not see what was coming, what was standing right in front of their faces, yeah. which was Palpatine mm -hmm. of the Sith Lord was, uh, was leading, was leading the Republic Senate. Yeah. So it, it, as Chancellor and and the, the silly character from the first movie, the quote silly character, yeah. was the one that gave him the last bit of power, the last thing he needed to become powerful. Exactly. And so therefore you've got the quote, the silly monk being, um, the, what the Buddhists might call the silly monk, mm -hmm. um, being the one that's about ready to, to put you down because you couldn't tell that, he, that all the silliness and craziness do, that that allow that monk to survive mm -hmm. and miss being shot or miss all these other things but there was something else working behind that mm -hmm. and and so therefore you have all these smaller things that these other folks couldn't see it was standing oh he's silly he can't he can hardly speak he's not intelligent and i thought the jedi and and the in episode one i were horribly um uh arrogant towards jar jar yeah. at the beginning so it's mm -hmm. like okay there's a there's this seething arrogance within 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 the Jedi and and their characters were intentionally showing it. Mm -hmm. I honestly think they were showing their downfall. That Lucas was trying to show how they led to their own downfall. Yeah, you know it's it wasn't as simple as good and evil. So it's really interesting, um, and I, that's why I like how Hero's journey works into mm -hmm. works into this as, yeah. as we continue talking about it. Yeah, and um, even with Luke at the in the last three yeah. um trilogy part um 
he basically says the same thing about the fall of the Jedi being right. their hubris. Their end. They were overconfident in a way, and they didn't see it coming. Right. And this is, I, I think what's interesting is that so many people got so upset of how Luke was written into the last set. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but I, 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 despite the comics and despite these things, there's this approach you need to make with the characters that isn't making them suddenly the great hero all over again. Mm -hmm. They went through that path already. They, they went through that hero's journey. Luke tried that hero's journey again and he failed miserably. Mm -hmm. And he understood why he failed miserably because he did exactly what the Jedi Order had done. He, yeah. While training others, he totally missed that there was one standing in front of him mm -hmm. that, 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 that was going dark and he pretty much pushed him dark the rest of the way. Yeah. And it ends. Yeah. Um, with Obi-Wan Kenobi, mm -hmm. you know, in the first three, you see that buildup of him trying to mentor Anakin mm -hmm. and then failing at it. And then he goes off and he does watch over Luke, but he's a hermit. Mm -hmm. And then in the last three, it's Luke that's a hermit. Mm -hmm. And we don't get to see the um, what happens with Ky it's Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Um, you know, how he transformed to the dark side. Mm -hmm. We know that Luke had tried to train him, but it um, and he would and we also know that 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 Kylo Ren was in contact with with some sort of Sith being yes. that was trying mm -hmm. that was training him and Luke figured it out. Mm -hmm. No, and Luke's biggest mistake was to pull on him. So you've got a Knights Templar mm -hmm. pulling on one of his own on one of his own trainees, even if that trainee was going sour, this knight this knight was going to kill his own trainee. Yeah. And even though he hesitated in the moment, it was already too late because his trainee saw it and that was all he needed to go completely to this to this other side yeah. which would you blame him so it's again mm -hmm. it's a gray space it's not as e as as easy as good over evil those are so those are so cleaned up and soapy mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and squeaky clean and and we realize that the the multiverse is not a squeaky clean place yeah you know so and neither is our simple part of the three dimensional space that makes mm -hmm. it up so yeah and then you know there are some somewhat obvious, more historical um, analogies with the Cold War. Um, because at the time Lucas was writing this, and apparently he went through numerous versions of the script, <laughs> uh, what he first came up with looks nothing like right. the final version right. for Star Wars. But um, what was the biggest news besides Vietnam, and Vietnam was part of it, is the Cold War. You know that the evil Soviet Union versus oh, evil, yeah. yeah, versus the good United States, right. and yeah, you know, one of the things I was always taught in my um, history classes about the Cold War is that America always had on these rose-colored glasses; they saw red in everything, mm. and anything that hinted at socialism or hinted at um, communism was bad. It, there was no gray area. And Vietnam, there was a lot of gray area. Because if you look at the history of the Vietnamese people, um, they were really going to a more traditional version, but it was just being called communism right. in a way. Um, and so, but the Soviet Union is seen as being behind everything. You know, whether it is um, back in the Chinese when during, I believe it's Korea, the Korean War, when they believe the Soviets are back in the Chinese. Mm -hmm. And it was at a time when the Chinese and the Russians weren't speaking at all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they they didn't quite get all the nuances right. of it. And I think it blinded them to certain things. And that's something I kind of see with the. Um, with Luke up against Vader, mm -hmm. you know, he, at first he only sees evil. Mm -hmm. And as we go through that original trilogy, you see that kind of change. Right. He wants to reform. It changed, you see it changed with Luke from his, he was wearing light color mm -hmm. when it started. And as it moved, it moves further away, he was back to wearing, he was wearing black mm -hmm. by Jedi. 
And um, of course, he went back to a to a kind of dirty white gray um, by the time he was a, a Jedi master. Mm -hmm. But but he had gone through that, and you saw it move from white to brown because mm -hmm. he was wearing brown, and then yeah. it moved to black. Yeah. You know, and you noticed that they were trying to get us to pick those pick those images up. Mm -hmm. And there was um, there was also something with uh, when you go to the uh, go to the original the, the prequel. Where um when when Anakin talks about um, when Anakin mentions well he's Vader at this point but not in the suit yet, where he mentions um from my point of view the Jedi are evil, and he didn't just say that just mm -hmm. to say it, um so it it was really interesting where uh, again there's that arrogance and we mm -hmm. go right back to that point with the United States the United States will will will, will say for instance socialism I said yeah but you 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 would never attack socialist democracies like Sweden, Finland, mm -hmm. why would you? Those, those are all capitalist, those are all uh, uh, socialist democracies. Yes. They don't, mm -hmm. they, there's nothing about them that even resembles what you're calling socialism. Yeah. Um, but yet, and yet, and here in our own country, we have numerous features of socialism listed yeah. within our own nation that mm -hmm. has been here since its founding or grew, in, grew into it from, the, from public schools to the post office to the military to all these things that we do mm -hmm. that are that are combined and to the point where all of our all of our states are connected without country lines mm -hmm. you know where we did this social thing and came the socialist thing and came together mm -hmm. and there you know you don't have the, a border passed in order to cross over Europe did it too yeah. so there are these things that don't match up with what people are calling socialism when they, when I'm thinking are you talking about national socialism like Nazism I said mm -hmm. that's a nationalism being injected into anything destroys you know these concepts and here national socialism is is it was was really what what seems to have been used which was Hitler's right. mm -hmm. um, is what the empire became yeah it became national socialism mm -hmm. but the good um, the old Republic allowed the uh, allowed the um, the clone soldiers to come about mm -hmm. that started that move yeah. so again the good you know moved moved in that direction and we have proof that we are susceptible as human beings to actually doing such a thing yeah you know if the 21st century has shown us anything and the other thing about the Cold War is the weapon aspect ah. because during the Cold War, everybody was afraid of mm. um, mutual assured destruction. <laughs> yeah. Mad, which is, yes. I've always found that. The day after, <laughs> 1983. Yeah, but, um, and what does the empire create? Mm -hmm. But the Death Star that literally blows up a whole planet. If there had been a nuclear war, you know, very little of the earth would have been habitable. Right. Um, especially in the two main countries, but it would still have been, you know, yeah. Europe had been targeted and um, China and, you know, everywhere else had right. been targeted. Um, and you might have ended up with India and Pakistan with nuclear weapons pointed at each other and, and Africa left. But, you know, you would have had North America pretty much obliterated, Europe and large parts of Asia obliterated. Northern Africa would also have been obliterated. Yes. Those were targets, mm -hmm. NATO targets. So yeah. Um but in Star Wars the Death Star wasn't 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 two sided. It wasn't a two sided mutually assured right. destruction. That's true. It was a one sided destruction. Yes. You know? Um and the, here's the and if I could think of the line uh that, that yeah I can think of the line that, that Princess Leia uses. Um the the more you she said it to Dick Tarkin, the more you tighten your grip the more star systems will slip through your fingers. And she said it with this <laughs> grace that you know she did not use again after that. But yeah, yeah it's, mm -hmm. it was that, it's that kind of thing, that kind of thing that you could threaten to completely blow us up, you know. But then more of us will fall away, and you can't get us all. Yeah, you know, it's that mm -hmm. kind of mentality. You can't. What you're gonna do? Squat mm -hmm. us all. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. And then they do the same, you know, massive type weapon in. Um, the number seven and the seventh one, seven, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's Force of Force Awakens, I think Force, Force Awakens, yeah. And um, and, but it's worse, you yeah, know, because it's you know they turn a whole planet into right a weapon yeah. that can destroy numerous planets at once. Yeah. In one system, they can just wipe out an entire solar system, and oh, and I'm so I'm not 
it, it makes me wonder about again where now where the story which i think the bare bones of the story was laid out by lucas before he sold mm -hmm. it off so the bare bones were still intended to what where were we going with with that destruction what were we bringing that back up for yeah. it, mm -hmm. it, there's always the criticism about oh, about oh we bring up another super weapon I said, yeah but why was it brought up again humans tend to repeat themselves Absolutely. history tends to repeat when we when we forget about it mm -hmm. so yes the idea was brought back again why and that's where you question why in the story it happened what was going on in, in, in life at the time those were those were uh, mm -hmm. those stories were being written out and what was really going on were we starting to repeat things and we were starting to repeat mm -hmm. things and it was already evident by that point that we were starting to repeat things already beginning to, to, to forget so again the story starts to go in that direction yeah i always found the last three of you know the last three movies to be a somewhat retelling of the original episode four five and six you know, Star Wars and Star Trek Back and Return of the Jedi. I just always saw a lot of similarities. Oh, yeah. And it's hard to not see them. It's mm -hmm. hard to not see them. And it would be hard to avoid them. Yes. You no, know, it really would be hard to to avoid them um, as we, you know, roll into the whole hero's journey and the whole idea. Mm -hmm. And that the hero's journey really never ends. Yeah. You know, it really, as much as we want it, it concludes, does it, though? Because mm -hmm. they hand off, the, they hand off um, the baton to the next, the next person in the group. The next. Yes person to go on that journey and then talking about weapons you know we can go off on little tangent about <laughs> especially from the original trilogy. <laughs> yeah because the weapons used um most of the original star wars was filmed in britain they used british weapons that were readily available at the time to create futuristic weapons they didn't have the money to create, and they certainly didn't have 3D printers and that sort of thing. Um, and all the prop people we have today in the movie business, they had to make their own. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what they did. Um, the first one um, is, and the most famous one is Han Solo's blaster. Yeah. I mean, it is by far I mean, the it's... most recognizable and it they, also plays a part in the biggest controversy in Star Wars fans. Well, the guitar string out in the middle of the field? Yeah. <laughs> or whether, um, what was it? <laughs> Did Han fire first in the cantina? Isn't that, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do. You know, people argue about that one all the time. But, you know, it this gun plays part of it. But. Han Solo's blaster mm -hmm. was a Mauser C-96. Um, it is the most famous and most recognizable weapon, other than the lightsaber. Yes. Um, in the movie, technically, it is a Blastec DL-44. <laughs> but we know it as Han Solo's blaster. Um, and Luke Skywalker does carry a very similar one in Empire Strikes Back. And it does change from through the movies even though it carries the same blaster there are some changes to it um in empire the barrel is shortened and the muzzle device was shaped differently and colored silver um the scope was also shortened and changed in shape in jedi the muzzle device and scope were changed again although only slightly yeah. um but throughout all the three films the mauser's distinctive wooden handle which gave it its nickname of um, the broom handle. That was the nickname for the Mauser C96. Right. Um, it never changes. You still have that broom handle um, on the pistol or the blaster. Was it really a broom handle? No. Oh, okay. It was just wood that was shaped similar to a broom handle. Okay, All right. So it. I mean, I didn't know they'd cut off pieces of a broom handle, slice it in half, and put it on each side of the pistol. I don't know what they did. No. Okay. It to just make it easier looks, to hold or something. Yeah, it just kind of looks like a broom handle. Okay. Um, and then we have the Stormtrooper E11 blaster rifle. Um, some of these are really fascinating how they changed the weapon. Um, the, the blaster rifle is a British Sterling L2A3 submachine gun. Um, which what they did, a shroud was added to cover the barrel vents. A dummy scope was perched atop the receiver. 
um, and an extremely shortened magazine was added. Um, and you can see it protruding from the left of the normal position where the magazine would be. Um, and you only see it shoot and stun one time yeah. when they shot later at uh, the very start. And you never see that weapon used in stun form and stun uh, setting ever again. And the other thing that if you watch closely, which a lot of people who watch these weapons to figure out which real weapon was used, right. in the first episode, you can actually see the blanks shooting out of the side of the gun. Oh, really? They fired them. <laughs> um, they couldn't, they didn't take that effect out of them because they wanted it to have the kick right. that gun would have. Right. Although it's a laser, so <laughs> well, I don't know if it didn't have a kick. But. And and let's let's uh let's let's drop that one really hard on people because if it were a laser you wouldn't be able to see it. So yeah. <laughs> uh, you know and you certainly I mean okay so you know so they were using some sort of plasma weapon right well yes mm -hmm. but um whenever they would use the word lasers it's like yeah, but unless you're shooting through a through a cloud or through steam, yeah. you're not gonna see that. So yeah, that's that. And here's the thing with language in the weapons and and the technology is um is I noticed they stopped making this mistake. Um, they stopped making this mistake after the second after the second original film after the Empire Empire. So they'll say make the jump to, to light speed. I said, wait a minute, are you going to jump to light or are you jumping into hyperspace? Yeah. Which one are you doing? Because if you just jump to light, you're not going anywhere. Yeah. You might as well use a tricycle. <laughs> you're having to jump into hyperspace in order to in order to make the jump in order in, in order to enter the hyperspace lanes right. mm -hmm. to get across the galaxy because you're then outside of regular space, normal yeah. space where light speed does not matter. So I even as a kid I knew this. Mm -hmm. So I was like, uh, and I was nine when Star Wars came out. I was uh, at no eight somewhere. May I was still eight. So it was kind of crazy to listen to the language and go, be a little confused and go, do you, but you'd have to not, light speed's not going to get you anywhere. <laughs> so I've noticed that and, and they cleaned the language up later, but yeah. other weaker TV shows would come out and use the language and not know what they were talking about at yeah. all. You know? And you know, something, I've always thought of this as, that galaxy must have been awfully small. <laughs> You know, because if you look at Star Trek, which we talked about last time, you know, from the Alpha Quadrant to the Delta Quadrant is um, 70,000 light 100, years. 100,000 light 100, years. It would take them 70 years to get back or something. Because they were at the 70, the Voyager, they were at the 70,000 light year distance point. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but the galaxy itself is 100,000 light years. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, it would have taken but he, you know, the hyperspace speed would have been massively faster well the hype speed. yeah the hyper the hyperspace but the, the hyperspace that uh but we would later realize they were using hyperspace planes mm -hmm. i get the meaning behind those i get those also they're traveling in a very limited in a very limited um section of the galaxy that right. were uh, where the where the center of the republic is mm -hmm. they're not going but so far across all the stuff they know about all yeah. and even 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 to, to roll back to star trek in its early days they kept making mistakes like like the in them going to the edge of the galaxy and passing through. i'm thinking what do you know how far off that is and you know even they kept making these mm -hmm. early mistakes that are now inside the canon so yeah, yeah that we there are some things that we have to Hyperspace lanes were not described until the books, mm -hmm. as far as Star Wars goes. So in that tech, it made sense. They knew they had to make sense. And I think they knew they had to make sense um, when J. Michael Straczynski's Babylon 5 came out and made great sense as to how they were traveling space yeah. using something similar to hyperspace lanes. They were mm -hmm. opening up, they were opening up um, jump gates into 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 hyperspace essentially yeah. mm -hmm. so and i'm like and okay that's pretty similar to what they were supposed to be doing in star wars yeah. so uh, the ships weren't moving at light they weren't moving mm -hmm. hardly at all they could just open it open a jump point and move through the jump point right. in battlestar galactica on the ronald d moore's version of it because the original just kept making a mess of the language <laughs> um or at light speed i'm thinking yeah but you're not going anywhere if you're at light speed <laughs> And it's that same technology issue now, and 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 um, Ronald D. E. Moore's version again. They used going by Star Wars, going by how are they going to do this? Well, they're using jump technology. They're, mm -hmm. they're folding space and jumping across right. the fold. Mm -hmm. So whether you're using hyperspace or you're using uh, uh, folded space, 
whatever energy that takes and all the physics that go behind it, I'm not getting into it. Yeah. <laughs> Still, they made sense of something that had not been made sense of in these early years when Star Wars mm -hmm. first came out and they were yeah. just throwing words around. I'm thinking, quit saying you're jumping to light speed when you're actually jumping to hyperspace. You're jumping mm -hmm. in the hyperspace. So, yeah. yeah. I think Lucas was more um, focused on the hero's journey. Right, he right. Was, he didn't realize how important it would be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> later on to make sense of all these other smaller yeah, things because, and you know smaller things like leah's pistol yeah she you know she was barely seen with that pistol <laughs> i mean but it's a major thing and the thing is it was not made from a pistol what was it made from it was made from a target pistol so it wasn't a real pistol <laughs> it's a 22 lr target pistol um and it's a russian Vostok Margolin 22LR target pistol, to be exact. Okay. Um, and so it wasn't even a real, you know, they added a longer barrel to it mm -hmm. um, to create the look of it being more futuristic, but you can still see the sight halfway down the barrel. So, <laughs> um, but it, it was never much of a, you know, they didn't much pay attention to the, actual gun until after star wars came back and now it's a big collectible right from but it's not a collectible for gun collectors but star wars collectors <laughs> it went way beyond where i'm glad it went way beyond where lucas was expecting yeah you know, mm -hmm. you know it, it frustrating but exciting as well yeah it's like i didn't know i need mm -hmm. to do all this it's like yeah well this is what you get for making such an incredibly good movie <laughs> and it being edited by but your wife, your first <laughs> wife, who really was on your side. And that's why that that's why Star Wars, the first Star Wars movie ever was a success. Mm -hmm. And the, the first trilogy is because of his first wife. Yeah. You know, having edited the films together. So mm -hmm. and um, because he's not the greatest of editors. Yeah. You know? And I read a couple of things about his, you know, original script. And I think. God, it would have never gone anywhere. I said that I, was awful. I had several versions of the script that I used for my students and uh -huh. I of the older scripts, and I tell them to choose any of them mm -hmm. to talk about and to to write about what the journey was and the characters and what was going on mm -hmm. in these other scripts. How was the how were these other scripts being yeah. used? And mm -hmm. so yeah, it, it's really interesting when you really go back to seeing, you know, so others had to help them come in and and really yeah. tear that down. Mm -hmm. So which is truly an amazing writing process. You know, it's an amazing write a story for it. Um, yeah. And um, now the next one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because you know he has a horrible death, but apparently he's not dead. <laughs> I never thought he was. Well, he was supposed to go into the belly of the beast. Yeah, and... but he was wearing his full outfit. That's true. I was never convinced that he was ever dead. Mm -hmm. They just never went back to him until right until right. Mandalorian. Right. So, but his is basically looks like a sawed off blaster which i don't know how that would work but um sawed off shotgun baby yeah <laughs> um, but it was a welby and scott number one mark one 37 millimeter <laughs> flare gun another that's not an actual gun not an actual flare gun right um and they you know added a few things to it to make it look more futuristic they cut it down um they added uh, more of a barrel to it futuristic or complicated i think complicated i right. don't think really futuristic it's not really so much as futuristic as complicated when you think of futuristic weapons i think of more star trek right 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 you right. know that's what i'm thinking yeah, they, mm -hmm. they don't really look all that much futuristic they just look complicated yeah so yeah it was it was supposed to be something unusual Right. Mm -hmm. Unusual and complicated makes more sense. Yeah. For what he was going for. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And then we have a rebel soldier, the Blast Tech A two eighty, which was the rifle they used on Hoth in the Battle of Hoth. Right. Um these were German World War Two era rifles. Um it was the Sturm Gewehr 44 rifle. It's the FPG 44 is what they call it. Right. <laughs> it was a good try. You did it better yeah. than I would have. <laughs> but it was mostly used on the Eastern Front during World War II. Okay. So, um, and there's a similar one used um, by the rebel soldiers in Jeddah. 
Um, and then the sand troopers, really the, some of the first guns you see used a lot um, in the first movie, um, Tatooine. Oh, sand people? Yeah, I know the um, the sand troopers, the storm troopers that are. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You only see them like once, maybe twice. Yeah. Yes. I, I always tend to think of, I mean, this is probably bad, but um, what was the spa in Spaceballs? The ah, ah, in the ah, desert. <laughs> and the they big giant, yeah, big with giant big comb. giant combs. <laughs> that shows how big yeah, I am that I have seen. And a guy with an afro, all um, the cultural things they were throwing into that. Oh, yeah. Um, but that one was a, um, a Lewis machine gun. Okay. Oh, that was a World War One era weapon that they used. And it's really, it's the only really American weapon that they used in that first movie. Because the um, Lewis machine gun was originally invented by Americans, but then the British did their version of it, and that's the one that was used. Mm for the um, sand troopers. Um, and now we could talk, there, there are lists and lists and lists of right. various guns, but we're not gonna, um, <laughs> we're not gonna bore everybody with that. We can right. ask a <laughs> question. But I do wanna talk about the weapon of Star Wars. And that is the lightsaber. Light <laughs> um, which is, Famously, some of them were actually made using what we used to play with as lightsabers, flashlights. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, you know, the, I think the Obi-Wan Kenobi one is made from, um, yeah, it's made from a Royce, Rolls Royce DeWert MK8, MK9 jet engine balance pipe. Wow. <laughs> But the rest of them were um, flashlights. These, the, they were made from various types of flashlights. And as little kids, well, we were using <laughs> flashlights to do that. <laughs> Turns out that's exactly what they did too. <laughs> <laughs> and they used a, um, to give them the, the part that shows us the, um, the light, right. the, the laser crystal thing. Right. Um, I don't know exactly what you would call the blade, anyway. Right. Um, the saber part of it. <laughs> yeah, the saber part of it was actually a German, um, it was a bulb yeah. that the Germans used that were in replace of, and then they added in the color when later you, on. When you see Luke and Vader, and if you roll back to the older versions, you might still be able to see it even in the ones that have been remastered, mm -hmm. and you see Luke, uh, not Luke, you know, you see, uh, you see, um, Ben Kenobi and uh, Vader tapping them together, mm -hmm. and you you catch it at the angle where you see the bulb, without the it's like it's like you can see them tapping bulbs together, and it's just for a moment, so they didn't yeah. even bother. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like yeah, you can see that. It's like <laughs> it's like is that a clear bulb that's at the end of that? Which it is. It's so pretty yeah. amazing when you can catch that. If anyone out there wants to catch that. Yeah, in the beginning, you um, the lightsabers are they're both green and red, mm -hmm. correct? And then Luke's becomes blue when he builds his own. Right. Um, so, so yeah, green. Well, no. Uh, or my guy backwards. No, it's light, like light, light blue and red. And um, the I think purple becomes Mace Windu's. Yes. You know. You know why? You know, Mace Windu was a was a was a was um, suspected to be one who used both sides of the force, and he had the ability to use both sides. So his saber. Uh -huh. uh, reflected his shoes. But do you know why they chose purple for that character? I'm going to guess the, the actor was the one that did that. Let me yes. <laughs> um, the actor, Samuel L. Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson. Um, always incorporates purple into every one of his roles. <laughs> and so he purposely had them use his lightsaber to be purple mm -hmm. because he likes the color purple. <laughs> and no joke on the movie name, the color purple. But yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so um, that is actually something he put in there. I you know, so, had yeah. put, but yeah, the idea of it being a mix of light and right. dark side. You know, that he was a that he was a mm -hmm. user, uh, someone who could use who could use both sides, and and that's not a new concept. Mm -hmm. um, as um, as that that was introduced in the also in the Marvel universe, where someone said anyone who's that good can use 
both sides in order in order to keep balance you mm -hmm. know but if you keep teaching oh there's only one light side and there's a yeah but you have to you have to keep them both in balance with each other so there's you have to know how to use that other end in order to keep it in balance you have to walk the gray line yes. and that isn't understood often mm -hmm. so i definitely can accept uh, mace windu's character being um someone who would walk the gray line and yes. know how to do it mm -hmm. you know i absolutely and he showed that when he was willing to take down the emperor mm -hmm. um, and not bring him to trial i mean i'm not saying right or wrong i'm not making a judgment of it in that regard but it's mm -hmm. really interesting when you watch that and it makes sense for his character even though that's retconned in yeah so yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> because of the lightsaber color <laughs> <laughs> we're such geeks oh god <laughs> well let's get a little bit deeper in something that we've talked about kind of throughout and that is Thank joseph you. campbell's hero's journey absolutely and um john's gonna play the next clip which you'll see later um, but if you'll just kind of introduce what the hero's journey is. Well, um, when is John playing the next clip? <laughs> he, well, he's not playing a clip. It's just a slide that has a little animation to it. Um, I'm not the greatest at doing this impromptu. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, no, 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 that's, uh, that's absolutely okay. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, I'm not that great at doing, at, 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 at um, introducing the, 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 um, the hero's journey, basically, but, um, I can go through the several worlds it takes for, you know, Joseph Campbell, uh, and I believe it was a man, the, a man with a thousand faces, I believe. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the hero, of, yeah, the hero of a thousand faces. I have two copies of this <laughs> book, and yet I can't remember. Um, wrote with in a hero of a thousand faces, where he was talking about the journey or, um, that that the hero or a person takes through life, mm -hmm. and there are several. Um, there are several acts in which this happens. Act one um, being, for instance, act one starts the ordinary world. Mm -hmm. um, the ordinary world, call to adventure, refusal of the call, meeting the mentor, crossing the threshold. That would be act one. Mm -hmm. um, act two would be tests and allies and, um, and enemies, approach of the innermost cave, the ordeal, uh, then in the initiation. And reward, which um, which um, which is Acts one um, one A, um, I'm sorry, Acts two A and then Acts two B, mm -hmm. and then the and then um, the road back, re the, as in the third act, the road act resurrect the road back resurrection and return um, return with elixir, mm -hmm. um, and then we and then once we uh, get back again. A lot of the time, the, the the hero's journey starts back again at the ordinary world, which is right. where you're getting back mm -hmm. to. So, um, and we see um, the ordinary world as we meet Luke. Mm -hmm. As we meet Luke, we meet him on Tatooine. He's just a moisture farmer on a planet with relatively few clouds, but okay. <laughs> so, but they were just draining it from the, the planet's actual atmosphere. So I get right. what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and no wonder it was a desert and remains a desert. Yeah. Um, but but again, moisture farmers. So we meet him. We get to understand him. We even get the feel for him when he wants to roll off to the academy, mm -hmm. and but his father, but his his uncle won't let him. And we realize, and we look back on this, right at the start of the journey, it's like you want to roll off to the Imperial Academy. Yeah. So how much? And this makes sense in the hero's journey. This would make sense say a kid who wants to join them goes into the military doesn't matter whether he's russian um chinese doesn't matter american mm -hmm. um and he's like oh i want to go to the academy i want to join in and whether he he doesn't really know anything about the socio-political uh, standings of his localized world mm -hmm. doesn't really understand it. he just wants to be a part of something yeah he just wants to get away from home mm -hmm. this is the start of that process for anybody any soldier anyone not just soldiers, but anyone joining. Yeah. And so, when, since we're at mil, you know, we're at military college, it's best to really put it in that kind of perspective. Mm -hmm. So, do you blame him for saying he wanted to join the academy? Oh, well, how terrible! Well, why are you judging him? It's not like he knows what's yeah. happening, mm -hmm. what that political social environment is like. He's just doing a job. He's just trying to be a part of something. Yeah. So we get to feel for <clears throat> that character. Yeah, although he is aware of the rebellion. He is. But so. he gets, but he's only like an excited kid, though. The rebellion? You yeah. Know? <laughs> and then we have the call to adventure, which is R2D2. 
Right. Yeah, you know, he <laughs> literally comes to and shows the message of Princess Leia for mm-hmm. then Kenobi, um, or Obi Wan Kenobi. Right. And um, so there's that call, and then of course there's the initial resistance. Well, then is all they know knew him as. Right. Yeah. Until she mm-hmm. said Obi Wan. Yeah. So yes, you're right on mm-hmm. both ends of that. And then, you know, he doesn't, you know, he resists the call at first. And that's part of the right. hero's journey is the resistance to the call. Right. Oh, I got to stay around on the farm for the yeah. next uh, mm-hmm. harvest season. And yeah. and there's actually, for Luke, I think there are two resistance because he first decides to not pay attention to the message, to the call. Mm-hmm. And then when he takes the... Um, the lock off of R2-D2 and R2-D2 takes off for right. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Right. He meets Obi-Wan. Right, so and, meeting the mentor. Yes, he right. meets the mentor, and then the mentor again calls him on the adventure to go to Alderaan. Right. Now remember the point of crossing the threshold? Yes. When Luke no longer go back, you remember the scene? Mm-hmm. What was that scene? When he can't go back is when um, his aunt and uncle were killed. Were killed. Were killed. Yes. Lee sees their bodies burned up. Which is, burned, burned up, which is a gruesome scene. Yeah. It took me years to realize what I was looking at. I had bad yeah. eyesight. Mm-hmm. So it was till the tapes came out when I was able to look and go, oh my God, is yeah. that what they showed us? You know, so it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, you showed a bunch of little kids these burnt out blackened skeletons. Yeah. But again, they had to make the point, yeah. you know, as to how, how horrible that was. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, at that point and the music and how and how um, John Williams from the London Symphony Orchestra played that piece um, in, in, in the scene. Mm-hmm. You knew by the tempo he could not go back as the scene switches over to the Death Star and his and whom we know later would know to be his sister trapped, mm-hmm. you know, his twin sister trapped aboard the Death Star. Yeah. But he couldn't go back. The wind's blowing in his hair. Um and and the the scene moves and you have the threshold being crossed. Mm-hmm. There's no going back there. Yeah. So yeah. And then um once he's crossed the threshold, then the next step. That's the test. allies and enemies. Mm-hmm. You know, you try you you find out whom on Tatooine will help you. Yes. Um, you find out um, who will give you away. Mm-hmm. Who's your allies? We meet Han. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And we'll get to the archetype on Han in a minute. Hopefully we have time. Well, we were running out of time actually. Let's try and get there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so you have him finding the allies, realizing who the enemies are. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's the approach. They, the approach is to Alderaan. Right. And um, that leads you to the ordeal. Right. Which is um, <clears throat> the Death Star. Right. You know, they get pulled into the Death Star. And um, now, now in this, that may be and this that could be approaching the innermost cave, approaching your fears. Mm-hmm. In in Empire, he, they actually used the cave yeah. where Yoda told him, "You don't need your weapon." Mm-hmm. You know, and and we should have all known why this was not even as a little kid. I don't know how I missed it <laughs> when he slices the head off of Vader uh, in the cave, and boom, it opens up, and that's his face. Well, he, J, they just gave it to you, handed it to you. How did you not? Why did you have to wait to the end of the film to realize what he saw? Yeah. So it it was pretty amazing that that. So that's that's mm-hmm. where um um make making preparations is needed. So they had to battle, all, run all over the Death Star, mm-hmm. and in the cave where Luke, you know, he's already had a loss. His his family. Now he loses from his point of view. Loses. We know that. This he turned this loss loss is you know loss in the physical realm isn't 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 forever because they go back to wherever we go mm-hmm. and Ben speaks to him from there and helps him from there. Mm-hmm. But for from his point of view, he's been lost. Yeah. Ben was killed right in front of him. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. So again, the inner the events of the mm-hmm. innermost case facing the ordeal. And it's often that the mentor dies right. in the hero's journey. Right. And the archetype is used in the hero's journey. I want to do that one thing. Um that Joseph Campbell and George Lucas were really good friends. Mm-hmm. Um, they really, you know, Lucas admired Campbell a lot. Right. And absolutely, from the kind of writing that Campbell did on this, mm-hmm. absolutely. What it, well, I can't say what English teacher doesn't. I only did in the last couple of years have the book. 
uh -huh. but I love, absolutely love. There's a couple other professors who, who um, published Here's Journey work mm -hmm. from Joseph Campbell, and I use their stuff too. Yeah. You know, that's just um, the writer's journey. Suddenly, uh, I'm apologizing to the professor who might hear this that knows that's his book. Um, and I use it all the time. I had it sitting in front of me actually here and um, that I use all the time because he it, because he uses Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey material to talk about the Hero's Journey. And it's my favorite part mm -hmm. of, of teaching any form of literature or any kind of writing in regards to this kind of, or film review. Mm -hmm. you know, he, yeah. yeah, it's interesting you use it in your English class back when I taught high school. I taught used it in my psychology class <laughs> because I use Young's archetypes right. Right. to teach about the you know, the ideas of the myth that goes through right. all of us. And I use Young's archetypes too on mm -hmm. when I'm teaching. Yeah. Um about well, about about paranormal literature. Yeah. Right. And the archetypes and the hero's journey are so connected in a way. Um although they had Campbell had 12 stages and um, Young had eight. Okay. Something. Something. Trying like to remember. That. I can't remember. So we got the ordeal. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh. You know, the, the, where the where where the final battle is being had. Mm -hmm. you know, where they must come out the other end of that battle. Now, granted, for Star Wars, they simplified it. Of course, they simplified it. But um, but the Death Star was that ordeal. Luke's ordeal in in the second movie, of course, was battling his father. Right. You know that had to be his ordeal where he mm -hmm. had to come out on the other end. Mm -hmm. uh, so and and um, it, I would say that I don't think I don't know if a reward has ever reached there, and um, where a reward in Star Wars in the first movie in New Hope, yes, destruction of the Death Star, people celebrate and get medals. Yeah, and but now really some will say that the reward is them getting the Death Star plans mm -hmm. and taking them back because you have the road back mm -hmm. that could be seen as Luke, Leia, Han, Chewbacca, and the droids going to the rebel base mm -hmm. with the plans. Right. And um, it's the, you can see it as the resurrection um, as being the final battle with the Death Star. And also, you know, Han returning to, although he's supposed to have left, he returns to help Luke in the final stage of that battle. And then the re then you have the final return in the movie when you do have the presenting of the medals. And right. <laughs> and then it, and then I of course enjoy thinking on this on a much larger scale now about about the resurrection, for instance. Um, 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 the hero faces the resurrection his most dangerous meeting with death the final life and death ordeal mm -hmm. but and I think about the, the last movie where Luke appeared and, and when he appeared in the final no when he appeared in the, in, the, in eight episode eight uh -huh. um, and it's interesting he would talk about the resurrection he wasn't really as so much as a so much as passed away as mm -hmm. he was as he was a projection yeah. You know, force projection before his body was was gone. Mm -hmm. But it it's interesting how again another death ordeal, except um, except he did the ordeal knowing that it would that it would physically kill him, mm -hmm. knowing that it would physically kill him, uh, and that he would become force ghost at that point. Yeah. So it's interesting how the hero can intentionally um, go transdimensional. It's like okay, well, it, I know how this is going to end. Ben did mm -hmm. the same thing. If you strike me down, Vader, if you strike me down, I'll only become more powerful than you ever right. imagined. Mm -hmm. And he just let Vader do it. And of yeah. course, he transited into the force just before Vader hit him, you know, mm -hmm. to make it look, you know, he just did it himself. No body, no nothing, no blood, no guts, mm -hmm. which was a perfect, actually, I think was a really good uh, choice on Lucas's part. If that was, if he was the one that made that choice, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, to do it that way. But yeah. Yeah. And then um, we are really running out of time return with the old world <laughs> it's at one o'clock so <laughs> um do we yeah go go ahead and talk about the return return with the elixir is the final reward mm -hmm. so we essentially already went through it but the hero has um has resurrected purified and uh, and earned the and earned the right to accept back into the ordinary world where i said we would end mm -hmm. with going back into the ordinary world and share the elixir of the journey and and share that again and that and then and now we it, actually, it was 
handed over to him. The, the, the hero's journey was handed over to him. Um, he just didn't realize that it was handed to him to his thought from his father mm-hmm. without knowing that that's what really happened. But then he makes the attempt to hand the journey or to, to ultimately hand the journey over mm-hmm. when, you know, we don't know this for 30 something, however many years it took for that last trilogy to come out. Yeah. That how, how what he would do to try to hand it over and how badly it would go, which we mm-hmm. did talk about already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we've covered that. But yeah, the return of the you know to return with the elixir and, and re-entering yeah. the ordinary world again. Mm-hmm. I wish we had time to talk about the different archetypes. Oh. Uh, okay. Well, we'll we'll go ahead with it then. I you know we are virtual, so go for it. <laughs> if people have to leave, hopefully they'll be able to see the end of it on the video. But um, there are really ten main archetypes yes. um, that we can talk about. Of course, the warrior hero is none other than Luke Skywalker. Right. Yeah, he's the one who takes the journey. Um, and we see him, you know, through his transition completely throughout, you know, the last six movies. Yes. <laughs> he's not in the first. Well, he's in the he's not in one. the prequel, yeah. which are the first, which yeah. one's doing. He's just born at the end of the third prequel. Right. So, um, but, you know, he go. we've talked about the journey that he goes through. Um, and then you have the shadow villain. And I, I don't think anybody is ever as perfectly considered a villain as Darth Vader. And he was a tragic villain. Yes. He, he was, was a tragic figure. He wasn't mm-hmm. a pure evil figure. He was a tragic mm-hmm. evil figure. And we don't know that until... Really, when the prequels, we see how he became Darth Vader. At the end of the original of the original um, trilogy, we do yes. realize that he had mm-hmm. been a tragic one all along, because he switched at the very end. Mm-hmm. You know, when he threw the Emperor over, and that's a whole other story. But yeah. yes, we we only realize that his story is deeper than that mm-hmm. at the very end of, of the original trilogy. And one of the things about him is you see the signs. Of his anger throughout the prequels right. and how it overtakes him. But in the original trilogy, we see Luke trying to resist that anger throughout. Right. And he really reaches that in Jedi. Um, you know, he, even though the Emperor is doing everything he can to provoke Luke, mm-hmm. Luke, you know, right. stays good. Right. He essentially, yeah, he essentially, you know, keeps keeps just just inside the light mm-hmm. side, just in you know, just in the gray area, just yeah. inside it. But if you go, you know, if you think of the ultimate evil in the Christian world or the Judeo Christian Islamic mm-hmm. world, it's the devil. Mm-hmm. Well, what does Christian mythology say the devil was. But it was an angel that was it was he an was angel that was, angel. was fallen. Yes. It was thrown out. So again, mm-hmm. a tragic figure that didn't just yeah. become evil for the sake of evil. Mm-hmm. It was pushed in that direction. Right. You know, and who what or who pushed it in that direction. Again, it's like, ah, okay, I get it. <laughs> and so the whole the whole creator God kind of concept, emperor. It's like so the emperor pushed him off. Right. The emperor mm-hmm. was the one that started to get this war going and then told them and then pushed them off and made them fall and, and brought and made them what they are. Yeah. Just like Palpatine made Vader what he, you know, pushed him exactly. and pushed him from the time he was a child. Mm-hmm. So again, yes, that it's incredible that these and these are the same kind of themes we repeat in our religious systems and in, in, in our belief mm-hmm. systems. We don't want to. We imagine that there are these solid walls that can't be broken. And I'm thinking not that's just not how the human mind works. Yeah. <laughs> um okay, the threshold guardians. Mm-hmm. The, the stormtroopers. The stormtroopers. Mm-hmm. Um they are there to thwart the progress, even though they seem to have the worst thing in the galaxy. <laughs> Which allows our heroes to survive right wait right, right it's a plot a plot yeah. point but mm-hmm. they tried to correct parts of that in the in the last trilogy where yeah. some stormtroopers were not bad with their aim yeah you know mm-hmm. but yeah um and then the herald r2d2 R2 indeed <laughs> uh, he is the call to adventure um and he shares with c3po another archetype the child mm-hmm. 
um, the innocent picture. Right. And Cethrufio is very much an innocent, almost cowardly. Right. His know. memories get wiped half the time. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Um, Even if he knows six million languages. <laughs> right. He never seems to he's six million forms of communication. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he's so he's so completely funny. If you just, I've had friends who 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 brought up the idea that the entire thing of Star Wars is only about R2 D2 and C3 PO. <laughs> that they're the real heroes. Yeah. And there it's really about their journey. I've heard that before, had to bring it up, throw it in there. Well, one of the things I love about all of the movies is that the actor who played C three PO. Anthony Daniels. Anthony Daniels shows mm -hmm. up as himself. And I know the first three, mm -hmm. he shows up. Um, you know, the prequels. Mm -hmm. Does he show up as himself in... In the latest set? In the original ones and the I don't think he had time set? in the original ones. If he, I don't think so. I don't see how he had time. But I think he does in the final three. Okay. I'm almost certain he does. Okay, I wouldn't be surprised. So. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, I always found that interesting. Right. Um, and then the mentor, Sage. I'm concerned about the guys, but okay. But go ahead. Is um, Obi Wan Kenobi. Yes, indeed. Um, that's just. You know what's interesting is that with Alec Guinness played that role, mm -hmm. and I, and it was said that he really did not like the role at all. Yeah. I don't know how true that is. Mm -hmm. uh, but he would keep returning to it. So if he hated yeah. it so much, but anyway. It's so iconic that that's really what he's known for. I know, so and much he now. made so many great movies. And he did, but we know him as Ben Kenobi, <laughs> yes. as the first one, as you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was a fantastic actor. Right, and I've seen him in from, a few other things. From but... Dr. Zhivago to The Bridge of the Kwai, and mm -hmm. you know, there's tons of wonderful movies he was in. But this one iconic role, yes. and I know he must have hated it to his time day. That's what I'm known for? It's like, well, yeah, do you understand how big that is? And it yeah. is big. It yeah. is big that he was known for that. Uh -huh. You know, however he might have appreciated it or not. And even when, um, my names just go right out of my head. Who played him in the prequels? Um, oh, you and the Garter? Yeah. <laughs> there goes my memory. Right. But he will never be considered. Well, he wasn't meant to be. Yeah, no. But mm -hmm. he but he he was a great transition point. Yeah. He perfected mm -hmm. the voice. And it, and I can't remember that if it's true that you and the actor that played Wedge and the actor that is you and that, that and, and you and McGregor mm -hmm. cousins from the same family. And I didn't realize, you know, yeah, like I don't know if it's second, third cousins, whatever. Mm -hmm. But we're cousins from the same oh. family. I you know, know, and Wedge did show up in the last mm -hmm. in the pre in the in the in these last sets, these yeah. last set once. So yeah, they were supposedly that's that's the that's mm -hmm. the rumor. I don't know if that's true, but I've heard it way too many times, and I wanted to throw it out there for yeah. those who would look it up and see if it's true. And then we have one of the um, the most misleading of the architects, the false mentors, because they're not. You think of false and you think of bad. But why Owen and Baru? Why would we call them false? Um, because they are Owen and Baru they, Lars. <laughs> yeah, they are telling Luke a different story than what's real. Oh yes. They, they are protecting him from right. his father. And we see why when he, mm -hmm. when he's given to them as a baby. Yeah. Um mm -hmm. we see why they had to do that. Yes. And so the false mentor doesn't have to be a bad no, person. It no. doesn't have to they don't have to be a villain, but they have to be the ones preventing the journey. Right, right. And I like how you say not to be, not to be, you know, too cut about it. But <laughs> but they're blocking Luke's Luke's path. I'm correct path. They're they're in the way, and they pay for that with their lives and the scenes. Ruthless slaughter serves right. And we talk yeah. about that scene, mm -hmm. and that is a ruthless scene. It really oh, is. Yes. And I'm glad they didn't actually. We didn't actually have to witness it. We only saw the end mm -hmm. the end game of it. So yeah. yeah um, and at, I thought about that when I saw it at the end of the of the end of the prequel of the um in um, episode three at the end of the prequel when I saw the young the young Owen uh, uh, and Owen and Brew Lars and it's yeah. like oh my God we know what's gonna happen to them it was just really sad seeing them I have to make a confession I always thought her name was Peru. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it started with a P. I thought it started with a no, P. No, no, no. Luke, Luke, Luke calls her Peru. Aunt Peru. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, and her blue milk. I just. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> and then the companion, mm -hmm. which 
often is romantic in Hero's Journey. And she does start out as romantic, sort of. Sort of, but they don't get too creepy, luckily. No, they don't. Thank goodness. Because that would have been just <laughs> creepy. Luckily, Lucas had in his head who she was, so he didn't get creepy. Uh-huh. Yeah. But yeah, Princess Leia, the damsel in distress, but she's also what, the Was companion. she really? No, but she <laughs> she is meant to look like the damsel in distress in right. both the beginning of the original movie right. and the beginning of Return of the Jedi. Because right. she is, you know, that iconic right. scene from that, the, that, that iconic aluminum foil suit she yeah. wore, <laughs> <laughs> aluminum foil bikinis that she was wearing. <laughs> yeah. So um, I forget how she made fun of it. I, I, I can't remember, but you know, she is that. She is meant to seem like the damsel in distress, mm -hmm. but we know she never was. May the gods bless Carrie Fisher on her way. Yes. Mm -hmm. We love her. Yeah, and I'm glad they were able to computer generate her. To, to finish her off because they had done a lot of scenes they cut and they brought those back in yeah. but they amazingly blended it very well and they used to yeah. stand in to blend it over mm -hmm. you know and they had used cut scenes too that they used her in it yeah. was they did a brilliant brilliant job they did carrie fisher serious justice mm -hmm. they really did and then we have the outlaw shapeshifter <laughs> and that does really portray han solo right he is the outlaw. He didn't really care about the Empire one way or the other. No, he just wanted to avoid them and right. smuggle. Give me my money and I'll get yeah, yeah. money. And um, smuggle is what you love. But he's also the shapeshifter <laughs> right. because at times he is the um, what is Princess Leia call him a nerf herder? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Scruffy, scruffy nerf looking herder. nerf herder. Who's scruffy <laughs> looking? <laughs> but um, you know, he's a scalawag. He's right. a um, yeah, he's not. He's a swashbuckler. Yes. So he's not always good, but then he always comes back to the good and comes through. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we've already talked about the child. See right. Yeah. And now we got the friendly beast. The friendly beast, Chewbacca. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which Chewbacca is the only one, you know, we get to meet him in the original and then the prequels. Right. Um, so we get to see we, just we, how we, old. we get to meet him and, and we get to meet him in solo, which they really deepened the story by how those two yeah. Yeah. and then there's the awful holiday special. I'm not even gonna talk about <laughs> that. The, the whole everybody should have been executed that had anything to do with that, minus the actors. <laughs> yeah. I think sorry, I, think I don't I was, mean anything by it. It was I think just so I awful. I remember actually seeing that when it came out. I did too. Um, We're all little kids. And of course I used to watch the Ewoks, the cartoon. <laughs> yeah, I didn't watch that. But that was me. That was just me. And that was, by the way, I didn't mean anything by that. It's just that the holiday special was such a nightmare. I'm sorry. Yeah. I apologize to anyone who's listening that really had something to do with that. I don't mean anything by it. But I really, really thought that I just pushed that whole thing out of my head. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that kind of, uh, I have notes on the religious beliefs, but we've talked That's about That's a whole other hour. I know we've we talked about on. Buddhism and the influences of that throughout. So, right, right. Um, of course, there's also Jediism. But. Right, and that and that does that that does involve a lot of Hindu Buddhist mm -hmm. ideas that Lucas was, as far as I know, was into. Yeah, you know, was definitely involved in, and that, and I don't mean that in any kind of bad way. Mm -hmm. I honestly thought that that was really the perfect set of selections, more than the Judeo-Christian Islamic belief right. system. The mm -hmm. the the, the um, Oh Lord, now I'm missing my memory all of a sudden. There is um, Abrahamic, Abrahamic religions. Uh -huh. yeah. So I think that the choosing the more ancient religions, the more ancient systems on the planet, right. was was I think did more justice mm -hmm. than than going for the much younger ones. And it was also very hip during the seventies. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This is when you know Eastern religions and Eastern ideas were mm -hmm. really kind of picking up. They right. started in the 60s through the 70s. And, right. You know, so. But anyway, I guess we need to go to questions if we have any, if we have anybody still left watching. <laughs> Hopefully there is. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, so Mark Anderson says, uh, thanks for this interesting webinar. I hope you will do more Star Wars and Star Trek sessions again. Now his question is, have either of you read or heard about the ring theory of Star Wars? It was written by a quote super fan some years ago and is easily found online. Do you or any listeners have any thoughts? Okay, so what the question was is about the ring theory. 
Yes. I'm sorry. I don't um, know it, do you? I don't know it. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I tried to be as prepared as possible. You educate me because I don't know. <laughs> I'll, have, I'll have to look that one up. Yeah, I'll no kidding. Out, so. yeah, unfortunately, Mark's no longer with us. Um, he may just reach out to him. Yeah. <clears throat> and then Marcy Dean just had a comment. Great job. Wish I could see the Star Trek one. As do we. Uh, geeks and history rock. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm really sorry about the Star Trek one. It just did not record like we were supposed to. Hopefully this one is doing correctly. And I really wanted it to for my own to put onto my own yeah. blog as and well. We had so much fun doing the we Star Trek. Did. I had fun doing this one too. Yeah. The Star Trek and I'm a little more of a Trekkie than I am the Star Wars. But and I'm a huge, huge Trekker. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Okay. Well, Lenny, thank you so hey, much. Hey, thank you, and I hope to come back and talk about these again. I um, know we maybe we ought to do a Battlestar Galactica one. Or, oh. <laughs> me personally, I would like to do a um, Babylon Five, but <laughs> hey, if we gonna do it. If you would do the twos, Babylon Five and Battlestar Galactica, yes. both the original and Ronald D. Moore versions. Yes. Oh yeah, I'm all I, for I it. I don't remember the original one. But... I do, but I do. <laughs> But yeah. Yeah, you're a little older than me. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> but um I did watch some of them. We can but, do Ronald D. Moore. Let's keep yeah. it let's keep it good. But I did watch all of that one on the Christmas. Oh yes. Ronald D. Moore. I all of them, the spin-offs, I I have it all. Mm -hmm. and Blood then, and Chrome. And then Babylon Five, I've seen it. Two oh yeah. Three times. I have them all too. Yeah. yeah. So um, hopefully we'll come back and do those. Maybe we can do a couple of summer programs. And if we, we normally don't do summer programs, so. Now, if we do summer programs, you'll have to link me in from overseas. Oh yeah, you are, do go overseas. Well, maybe in the fall. Okay. So, I know we we need two more programs in the fall anyway. So. Okay, I'm all for it. <laughs> all right. Thank you everybody for thank attending, you. and thank you, Glennie, for being here with us. No problem. And thanks to John Hart for doing our tech part. Yay, John! We'll see. You. <laughs> we'll see you next time we have one of these. Thank you. Be well, everyone. May the force be with you. Always. <laughs>